All right, thank you, Heather. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today on this Friday afternoon. We're very, very pleased to have Sharon Mosier, who's the Dean of the Jackson School of Geosciences, come back and talk to us a little bit more about the outcomes and the next steps from the series of workshops and the project that she's been working on with many of you who are already on, online here for this uh, webinar. So, um, Sharon, take it away, please. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, joining me this afternoon. It's uh, a pleasure to be able to talk to you about uh, the outcomes and the next steps of the uh, NSF-sponsored uh, project that we have been working on since, I guess, 2013. Uh, next. Uh, first, just want to give you a summary of the, the things that we have done and then go into some of the results. Uh, as many of you know, in 2014, in January, we had the first summit, which was about 200 people, uh, everybody from uh, research universities with undergraduate programs, four-year private and public colleges, and a number of community colleges. And they were faculty, heads and chairs, and education researchers. And we had about 20 people from industry, government, and uh, professional societies. And this really was viewed as the first step in the development of a high-level community vision for the geosciences. And I think everybody at the uh, event was surprised that there was such collective agreement. Uh, subsequently, we had a community survey. We've actually had about 500 respond, but all the data I will show you is from 463 respondents. You can see from the graph the vast majority of more academics although there were 79 from industry. And I think the most important thing is that 85% were not participants in the summit. So if you combine the outcomes of the first summit and the uh, survey um, participants, I think we've gotten a pretty good view from the uh, academic community. Next. Uh, then in 2015, uh, we wanted to get a better feeling for what uh, geoscience employers felt, and we had 46 participants. We tried to have an even distribution from energy, uh, hydrology firms, uh, environmental engineering firms, as well as government agencies, which um, hire a uh, number of geoscientists. Uh, we had one person from mining. And I think uh, one of the things that actually surprised the participants was that there was very strong agreement with the results of the 2014 summit outcomes and the survey results, and that the geoscience employers really appreciated that the academics and they were pretty much on the same page. However, they added significant granularity to uh, what uh, had come out of the summit uh, based on what they felt students needed to know for employment. And then in 2016, in January, we had another summit, this one for heads and chairs of uh, geoscience departments. Uh, we had 109 people attend, and again, it was a broad spectrum from you know, R1 research universities to all the way to two-year colleges. And that summit focused on how do you implement the uh, results from the previous summit, the survey, and the Geoscience Employers Workshop. And that was something that the organizers and I were a little surprised. We were thinking we would need to defend what uh, had come out of these, but people came with the idea that this was important and that this was something that they needed to implement if they hadn't already. And by the time they left, uh, they all submitted an individual action plan for their department. And so we followed the same sort of format that we had for all the other um, events where we would have a short panel uh, discussion for people who uh, had experience or expertise in a certain area. And then we would have small uh, breakout sessions, about 10 to 12 people with a series of questions that they should address, uh, followed by reports uh, from each group to the entire group and then uh, a group uh, question and answer and discussion section on each of these different categories. Next. 
And one of the questions is, of course, why are we doing this? And it's really because our students, uh, as they enter the workforce today, uh, whether they go to grad school beforehand or not, today and in the future, they're facing a different work situation than uh, was true in the past. Uh, multidisciplinary work is uh, a priority, uh, looking at different kinds of data sets and different approaches to problems, and doing cross-disciplinary teamwork is really fundamental in the workforce now. The kinds of jobs our students are getting, uh, the jobs for geoscientists are different than they were in the past. We have a wider range of uh, potential employment. Uh, technologies changed. Uh, all the professions are more quantitative, uh, more use of computational skills and modeling. And in terms of big data, it's not just taking a big data set, but integrating multiple large data sets, modeling them, and doing statistical analysis. And of course, geoscientists now actually are more, uh, have more interaction in terms of business and business aspects of the job, as well as us. And so they need different kinds of training, economics, law, business practices, uh, certainly ethics, risk, and understanding of the environment. And the uh, workforce now uh, requires an understanding of cultural diversity, and of course there's a global outlook. So as I've said to uh, people before, as the workforce changes, student learning has to change as well. Next. So the questions that were addressed by the first summit, the Geoscience Employers Workshop to some extent, the survey as well as the heads and chairs uh, were the ones shown here. Um, improving competency skills and conceptual understanding, broadening participation, uh, adopting uh, research validated uh, pedagogies, and preparing K-12 uh, teachers. What you're seeing here is the results from the survey with blue being very and red being very important, red being important and so on. And as you can see, that the thing that the majority of people felt was the most important was improving competency skills and conceptual understanding. And that is one of the things that, because of that, we had a strong focus on that, although we did address the other issues as well. Next. And the first summit, the one in 2014, uh, one of the major conclusions was that it was more important to think about competency, skills, and con concepts that students needed to know than thinking about, okay, what courses um, should a student take? And the survey, if you look at academics and employers, uh, there was no question that, that overall was in, in agreement. Next. And so both the 2014 summit and the Geoscience Employers Workshop really looked at what concepts, and they vary from sort of the traditional earth science concepts, the things that most uh, geoscience departments cover, deep time, structure, earth materials, surface processes, and also other geoscience type topics, which some schools cover in great depth, others, you know, don't cover at all, or cover just barely. And they're things like climate, hazards, resources, and hydrogeology. And of course, a lot of the latter are things that the employers felt were very important. Next. And so they added a significant amount of granularity to what they thought these topics actually were and what they meant. But they also really emphasized the importance of systems thinking and really understanding the processes that were taking place uh, within the earth and the atmosphere and hydrosphere and how things were linked, what the feedbacks were, what driving forces were, what the impacts of these things were, and also time, you know, understanding time and scale in thinking about all these systems. Next. And both uh, the summit as well as, again, the uh, employer's uh, workshop uh, talked about this technical skills need that students really need to know how to use real data and analyze real data, as well as collect it. That they needed to you know, be able to do problem solving, both in 3D and 4D. And they needed to recognize that there was 
often no uh, unique answer, that the data could be ambiguous or you could have uh, insufficient data. Another thing that was stressed was quantitative skills, that higher level math competency was important. And in particular, understanding statistics, uncertainty analysis, probability, uh, being able to assess risk, and then computer programming and modeling, as well as field skills. Next. And a lot of emphasis on non-technical skills, uh, teamwork, uh, time management, project management, being able to communicate to both scientists and non-scientists, being able to understand what your audience is, being able to listen, all kinds of interpersonal skills, uh, the ability to lead, uh, act professionally, as well as ethics and understanding the impact of what you were doing relative to society and having a global perspective. Now, all of these concepts and skills, uh, there's a lot more granularity in detail, and if you're interested in that and don't have it already, you can go to the website that's shown here and uh, get that information, and there's handouts uh, for those next. So, given this, one of the questions we asked on the survey is whether uh, departments are interested in making changes to their curriculum to focus on competency skills and uh, concepts. And the vast majority of the departments uh, or the respondents from the departments agreed and that that was something that they were interested in. So then the question was, will you do it? <laughs> and uh, you can see from the graph on the uh, left uh, some are already done, some are in progress, some think it's likely, and quite a few think it's possible, and of course there's some that don't think it's going to happen. And one of the questions people had for me is, well, does it matter what level somebody is at as to what they think? And so on the right you have the same question, but it's broken up by dean, chair, professor, associate professor, assistant professor, and a non-tenure track person. And I thought it was kind of interesting if you recognize that on the right, already done is dark blue, uh, or yellow is in progress, green is likely, that the senior level people seem to be more uh, positive about the fact that change is going to happen in this regard. Um, although the uh, people at the lower level, you know, up to 50% uh, are positive as well. Next. So the Heads and Chairs Summit, the one in 2016, was really focused on implementation. And it was an interesting bunch because we had small departments all the way up to very large departments. The population of students varied greatly depending not only on the type of institution but also where uh, they were located. The reasons they wanted to change varied greatly. <coughs> and the stages they were at in terms of changing things and the scope of the change they were looking at was very different. Many of them said that the curriculum had not been revamped since the 80s or 90s. Some of them had recently completed it, some of it because of the first summit, uh, some of them uh, uh, were in the process uh, for other reasons. Next. So I think the biggest achievement of this uh, summit uh, for Heads and Chairs was that by the end of the summit, everybody had, for their, every institution had an action plan, something that they could take home for their specific department and try to implement. And so I've got 92 individual action plans. Every single one of them is different. Uh, but the other thing I thought was really important was there seemed to be a strong sense that this whole effort gave people an opportunity as well as a challenge to demonstrate that their department, the geoscience departments were essential and that they were not only essential you know, to the workforce and the world, but they were also a central part of every institution. And many people intended to take the handout from the Geosites Employers Workshop goals uh, back to their faculty, but
but also some of them were talking about taking them back to their administration. Next. So what were some of the things, uh, key things that came across uh, in terms of implementation? Uh, the uh, vast majority of people really liked the backward design approach, uh, the matrix approach. And uh, up in the far right, upper right, you have one of David Moak's uh, examples of the matrix with the idea that what you do or would do is take the concepts and skills from the employer's workshop and use the matrix to review your current courses, find out where you are not doing things, where you're doing things more than once. Uh, look at uh, basically what you are doing and then reconstitute your courses to combine concepts so that you ended up having students get the concepts and skills that you wanted uh, them to have. And one of the important things that I uh, came out of this was the idea is once you have this done, you need to let the students know what this looks like so that they can see why they need to know these things and where they're going to learn these things. And I've got the website for um, the uh, uh, CIRC's page with the uh, matrix design that goes through how one, one does that. Uh, other things that people are talking about is modular courses. They're forced to have semester-long courses, but maybe they could uh, make, you know, take a semester course and have sort of three different hopefully related topics or, or types of things like having, you know, geophysics and, you know, structural geology together or something like that. Another thing people talked about was overarching courses. Have two courses the same semester that share a field project or share, you know, some sort of data gathering data analysis project so that the students could see that those courses belong together or work together. And then other people talked about having a systems approach for all upper level courses where they were, students were, uh, saw the integration of different processes and linkages and such, uh, and why you wanted to, or needed to use different uh, disciplines to address, or sub-disciplines to address specific problems. Next. Like the first summit and also the Geoscience Employers Workshop, uh, the heads and chairs felt very strongly that experiential learning was important, uh, doing independent research, uh, integrating real data and data analysis into classes and forcing them to solve problems, uh, capstone courses in particular were thought to be important. Uh, obviously field courses are often capstone courses, but also having courses almost like a lot of the engineering programs where you have a design course at the end. Have some sort of project or problem-oriented course that all seniors take that require them uh, to use everything that they have learned that throughout their uh, uh, career. The other thing that came across very strongly was since the employers really felt that math and computational methods was critical, that it needed to be integrated into the geo courses at all levels and used to solve geoscience problems. Too often students take their math and then they never use it and they don't understand why they have to take it because it isn't used in their classes. Other people talked about saying, okay, if their university would let them or a college would let them, instead of the second semester of these cognitive sciences and math or even differential equations, linear algebra, have the second semester be geo, geophysics, geochem, geomath, and so on. And then on the other side, uh, the recognition was that courses had to involve written work as well as oral work, and that you really needed some courses where that was an, a, a integral part of that course. And then of course internships, uh, RAUs, things like that. And there was agreement that doing this early, particularly if you could do it as freshmen, really would make a difference. Next. So given that, one of the uh, questions, of course, 
that came out of the survey was what is really being done. And if you just look at uh, independent research, uh, other research projects or experiences using real data, traditional field camps, and other types of field courses, including field methods, uh, this is the results in terms of numbers. Uh, and you can see that traditional field camp and other types of field courses are more likely to be required uh, than the research, although a large number of universities um, are obviously trying to involve research and real data analysis uh, as an option in courses. Now, of course, these are these are responses from an individual. So this is what an individual within a department is thinking that is going on in their university or college. Next. So one of the questions I've been asked is, well, how does that vary between different kinds of schools? And so I realize this is kind of an involved slide, but what you see is required is green, optional is red, and no is blue. If you look at uh, four-year state colleges, uh, public R1 research colleges, um, and R1 private uh, colleges, I mean, and universities, if you look at those three, they're pretty much similar in terms of what they require and what they give is optional. When you come to the four-year private schools, they're much less likely to require traditional field camp than any of those others. And of course, when you look at the two-year colleges, the community colleges, uh, they don't, for the most part, obviously require um, the, the field training, but I think you can see that they optionally have a lot in terms of um, uh, independent research as well as research projects. Next. So another thing that, uh, in addition to looking at concept skills and uh, concepts, and, and sorry, and competencies, uh, the Heads and Chairs Summit also really talked a lot about pedagogy. And one of the questions uh, was what resources are available, and both through the panels as well as through uh, presentations from individual groups, uh, there was, you know, a list of different kinds of places one could go and different kinds of resources. A lot of campuses actually have resources in this regard, although that's highly variable. Uh, people very strongly said that geoscience was lucky at, because they had very good resources through the CERC website uh, and also through early career workshops that reach a great number of our young uh, entering faculty. and you know, other resources that are out there. And also stress the fact that NAGT has traveling workshops that uh, they will come to a university or college and help with these things. Some of the tools for success, uh, those that had already gone through the process of either changing their curriculum to concentrate on skills and concepts, or who were trying new teaching methods said that you should take baby steps, <laughs> one step at a time. Uh, you don't want to try everything at once. You want to work into it. And also, that it's really important to share practices within your own program so that people see what it is that, that works and doesn't work. And that if a colleague does something, let's say they do a flipped classroom and it's, it's successful, they need to be able to have data that shows that it's successful and demonstrate the benefits of doing it that way to their peers. And once some of these things are being done successfully, you need to have peer observation so that people can see what is effective and not and exchange ideas, as well as if you're trying to do something like that, have somebody who's done it come in and give you advice as well. Next. Uh, also, um, that you need to use multiple, as a head and chair, multiple ways to evaluate teaching, uh, not just student evaluations, but peer evaluations, and also have peer mentoring, where uh, people come in and talk about uh, 
sorry, come in and listen to you and then talk to you about, okay, this is how you can improve without the person feeling like they're being judged. And also as a department head and chair, uh, the need to encourage experimentation. Uh, a lot of people who try these new things actually fail at it and they need to be encouraged to try it again and, and talk to people who've done it and you know, retry. Um, you need to have their back as a department head or chair uh, so that you know, they don't get uh, hurt by trying to be innovative. And for people who don't want to change either teaching methods or content, it takes a lot of one-on-one -on -one negotiation from the department head or chair. Next. Another thing that came out of the heads and chairs was that assessment, robust assessment, was a critical step. That it's really important to know and assess whether the students are actually acquiring the skills and really understanding the concepts that they're being asked to. And there's a number of ways that were suggested. Uh, measurable learning objectives uh, were strongly suggested and the AAC and U assessment tools was uh, suggested as a common tool that would be helpful and I've given the website there. Uh, also really evaluating the entire program in terms of what they have learned uh, by looking at subsequent courses and also any capstone courses you have at the end. I mean, it's very common for people who teach field camps to say that that is what led them to understand what the students were not getting and go back to courses either they taught or to their peers and say, look, these things need to be, you know, something that the students carry forward. And so it's really important to have colleagues talk to each other. So if you're teaching a course, you need to know from the person who's teaching the courses before that what they're teaching, but also what outcomes they expect. And if they don't, the students don't have those, you need to um, either recognize it's not going to happen and include them in what you're doing or go back and talk to the person uh, teaching and that scaffolding of skills and content was something that was really important. The other thing was that it was important to demonstrate to faculty that assessment was not a waste of time. And a number of people, myself included, have uh, been in situations where you get faculty to sit down and decide, okay, this is what our outcomes are, this is the goals we have for our students, and once they do, you make them try to say, okay, how do we assess this? And find out not only did they have no way to assess it, in many cases, the curriculum didn't even give the students the opportunity to do these things. And of course, gathering data from your seniors as well as recent grads is very important to assess whether the students are getting what they need for the workforce. Next. And so one of the things that we asked in the survey was, does your institution track student learning outcomes or any sort of metrics? And actually, not surprising to me, it was pretty even in terms of people who did and did not. Next. So one of the questions in the survey was, you know, is your department interested in making changes to how teaching is done? And the vast majority, 20, 238, said yes. And then asking, will you make efforts to do so? Uh, you know, some were done, some were in progress, some were likely, a lot were possible. And then you ask, you know, how extensive are those efforts in your department? And, you know, 50 said nearly all are introducing reforms and you know 70 said most faculty a hundred said some faculty so what are they doing next slide this is the list that came out of the first summit uh, and was in the survey of things that people could do that were uh, pedagogical 
publicly uh, uh, validated methods. And you can see that the majority, again, uh, nearly all is blue and uh, most, uh, most faculty doing it, it by the same numbers I had on the last slide uh, is red. The things that they're doing are inquiry-based labs, uh, small group discussions or whole class discussions, some in-class exercises, learning, basically teaching using real data and research, and that's about 50% for those in terms of most or nearly all. And then you get to the think, pair, share, and team exercise and discussion. That is something that is starting to be used more. But then you get to these other things, uh, some of the things that Dave McConnell talks about, blended learning, exploring before they learn, uh, flip classes, classes around collaborative projects, and of course MOOCs. You can see fewer and fewer people are doing that. We also have this broken down by institution type, uh, by numbers rather than percents, which is actually somewhat more interesting in a way, and also a lot of data on use of technology in the class and also technology and field instruction, and that's all on the website. Next. So with the two summits, uh, and a little bit in the employer workshop, as well as from the survey, uh, there are a number of common, common concerns, as well as common comments, uh, about the challenges and barriers, uh, both to changing the pedagogy, as well as uh, changing curriculum to focus on concepts and skills. And I have to say the survey had a lot of open-ended questions, and I was surprised that almost every open-ended question had almost 200 responses. And I have gone through and read all of these, and so some of these come out of that as well. And the first thing is the concern that if you're emphasizing competencies or skills, does that re result in the students having less content? And certainly the uh, the Heads and Chairs Summit, I mean, the idea was that this is something you have to balance. You have to balance content that is necessary. They have to learn with the mastery of skills and recognize that sometimes less really is more, but then deciding when is less more. I mean, what can, you know, what is the most important thing uh, as far as your students' eventual, uh, you know, going on to grad school or uh, going into the workforce. And it was recognized, you know, there are programs that have flexible programs or multiple tracks, and it's hard to make sure the content is the same. And that's why having a matrix and having uh, it so that students can see it, as well as other faculty, they can see where they can get the concepts and the skills that they need by going through uh, different tracks because a lot of these things you can do in uh, a lot of the skills you can cover in almost any topic. Uh, also, small faculty, there's no question that it's very difficult for them to cover all the concepts. And this is one of the things that really, uh, as we get more things online, will make things uh, easier uh, for small faculty. And then uh, the comment that comes across constantly is, well, I can't add any courses to our curriculum, so what is going to be cut? And one of the things, that I think one of the breakthroughs that we've had in the summits is not thinking about courses, saying that you, you change the courses, you rearrange what the content is so that you get across the content that you feel the students really need. And then I got a lot of these, everything I teach is important and can't be cut as well as nobody can tell me what I can teach. And I think that's something for heads and chairs to really work on one-on-one -on -one so that people can see using the Geoscience Employers Workshop Outcomes, you know, this is what your students really need. This is what your students have to have. And so you're doing a disservice to your students unless you uh, change uh, the content uh, of the entire curriculum. Next. Oh, I did something else. 
Ah, there we go. Uh, another thing is, is change really needed? Uh, a lot of comments that traditional geology, that is what employers really think is important. And I don't think there's any question about that. That is what they think is important. But there's a lot of other things that they think are important. And to some extent, a lot of it they think is more important. And so um, just because a recruiter says, oh, we love what your students are learning, doesn't mean that they don't wish your students learned other things. Uh, another very probably valid concern is if you require higher level math or computational methods, your enrollment will plummet. You won't have as many majors because uh, we are, by and large, attracting a lot of students who uh, don't have the math uh, or computational skills. And some, some colleges, some universities, that is the direction they will decide to go, but they need to make sure that their students know that if they wish to go into a geoscience field as an employment, they will need to have these computational methods and these higher level math. Uh, the vast majority of majors coming out of geoscience programs don't actually go into geoscience employment, but if they want to, they should be able to. Uh, obviously, there's people who don't think these methods are real teaching uh, or they don't work, they're not rigorous, and other people who think the lecture style has worked for 40 years, you know, why should I change? Uh, Obviously, one reason for that is because the way students learn now and uh, students are, are different. And another common concern is that the education jargon. Uh, most of the people at the first summit and the second summit had never been to anything uh, related to education before. And so they found it difficult to sort of weed through what some of these words actually meant. And that was definitely true uh, for the um, uh, the survey as well. Next. And then really what are the barriers to change? Uh, things like promotion and raises being based on publications and grants not teaching, people being busy, teaching it isn't top priority. Uh, it takes time, money, and personnel to do some of these experiential learnings and flip classes. More resources are uh, enrollment pressures, um, uh, you get paid or your department gets more money the more students you have in a class or the more students you teach, so therefore large lecture classes are vital. Uh, if you really want to do something creative, you may have to have other departments work with you so that your students can do these kinds of things. Uh, concerns about how much change should you do and how quickly. and really came across uh, a great deal was students coming in have very different backgrounds, so incorporating quantitative skills, uh, especially early on, is difficult. And then increasing students' carryover of content and skills is something that takes quite a bit of work. Uh, needing to show the connections and correlations between what you learn in one class and then another. Next. And then the one I got a lot was uh, faculty who said, well, we aren't going to change or change is not going to occur uh, until people retire because faculty are set in their ways and are very resistant to change. Next. Uh, we asked in the survey uh, what uh, we identified in the first summit, different things we thought were obstacles. And uh, we asked in the survey with here, blue is most important and orange is important. And I've broken these up by you know, the position people held because people thought that, that was important. And you can see that basically most important is lack of time and lack of support, uh, financial resources, and then uh, to uh, also instructional design and the infrastructure. Um, and pretty much it didn't really make that much difference as to what level you were. You had similar uh, concerns. Um, where it differed was when you got to annual performance evaluations and P&T evaluations, and obviously the non-tenured, the assistant and associate professors found that uh, more of a barrier. 
uh, concern about student evaluations. Assistant professors were the main ones that had a concern, as well as deans, which is something about deans. And uh, only deans thought a barrier was uh, the lack of information was a barrier. Next. Uh, incentives, the summit identified, the first summit, a number of incentives, a survey, results, uh, asked about that, and a surprising number of uh, respondees said that their department offered professional development for teaching, uh, used teaching as an important hiring criteria, and had really worked to improve the infrastructure and rewards, other incentives, and uh, graduate student training was uh, less common. Next. And so the uh, heads and chairs uh, talked about uh, incentives. Uh, one of the things was, you know, things heads and chairs could do, such as read, you know, giving people time to do things, uh, providing funds, professional funds, mentoring, sharing resources, adding extra TAs, particularly undergraduate TAs, to increase class interactions. Next. And things that were both departmental and external repositories for information to on-ramp people to changing pedagogy. Uh, people really wanted brief videos on each of the teaching strategies that then had a link to the research that showed that these teaching strategies worked. Uh, the idea was that within a a department you would curate course specific materials that people could customize for their teaching and that there were a lot of things out there online that could be adapted that people should use such as the integrate modules and I you know put on here the links for the various search sites that are very helpful in this regard next uh, the other thing that came across in this particular group was uh, the importance of true YCs. I think the first summit, we really, uh, many people were very surprised about how creative and innovative the true YC faculty were, and it was strongly suggested that there would be, we would build relationships with the local two YCs uh, to coordinate course objectives, uh, curriculum degree plans because a large number of students now take two years at a community college and the last two years at a four-year college. And if you don't want those students to start at ground zero, you really need to communicate what should be learned in the first two years and discuss content objectives and how to, any evolution you have in your degree programs. Next. And articulation agreements are great, but it's more than course numbers. Uh, you need to make sure that transfer courses really transfer. There is a cultural bias thinking that, well, if they came from a community college or if they're an underrepresented group, they're not prepared uh, for moving on. But data shows that they are fundamentally the same when they're freshmen and sophomore, regardless of where they are. The other thing that was brought up was the idea of uh, credits from four-year CE, four-year colleges being transferred back to the two years so the students could get associate degree. That's both so that the students actually uh, have a degree if they don't finish, but also that's what uh, two-year colleges are judged on, is how many students actually get a degree. Next. Uh, a surprising number from the survey, uh, 140 uh, institutions do uh, help ease the transition um, between the two. And some of them have uh, interaction between the different institutions. Next. Uh, important things are building community for the transfer students, both before they come, such as joint field trips, upperclassmen from those community colleges, working with the students in the community colleges, offering research trips and field trips and inviting to YC students uh, to campus. And then after they get there, you need a bridge program. You need to integrate them into their community and have advising and uh, mentoring programs. Next. And the, the critical thing was to have a good communication between advisors at the two YCs and the four YCs that they are fed to. And 
uh, any 4YC that's interested in increasing their enrollments should increase uh, relationships with the um, uh, faculty at the two YCs because they will feed them and the students will also be more successful. Next. Uh, we also talked, and I'll go very quickly, we talked a bit about uh, uh, broadening participation. The majority of the departments do not have programs for it. Uh, the first summit had a list of different um, elements of successful programs, and you can see them there. And if you're interested in that, we have that uh, on the website next. And uh, the biggest challenge that Heads and Chairs thought was actually lack of awareness of geosciences and occupation and acceptance by families that this was a viable occupation. Next. And uh, there was discussion of retention, things that one could do in terms of summer research experiences, peer mentoring, mixed freshman cohorts, uh, that you had learning experience in tutors that weren't just for minorities but were grouped. Next. And recruiting things that uh, have been shown that you don't want to overemphasize the field or travel. Uh, you need to emphasize salaries, jobs, careers, ties, importance to community, societal aspects, and have the successful professionals uh, join them on any field trips or uh, visits that you have. Next. And you can increase diversity by working with two YCs. They actually mirror the demographics of your community and work with historically black colleges and uh, Hispanic serving institutional local high schools. Here's an example of UT El Paso and uh, El Paso Community College and also um, utilizing resources that are already out there. Next. So what are the next steps? Where are we going? Uh, we're synthesizing the individual action plans by institution type, which actually is more difficult than we expected. Uh, we need to continue to disseminate uh, particularly through articles in uh, EOS, Earth, GSA Today. Uh, and in January, every hedge and chair is, will be requested, and they're supposed to give us a report on how they have gone. Some of them have already reported. Uh, we will use those results to evaluate how to do success, people done successful implementation and what those strategies are and what the problems are, and try to generate information that the hedge and chairs find are needed, continue to disseminate the results, and the final goal is actually to have a vision and change document similar to that for biology. And next, just very, uh, we have a web page. This is just all the things that are on the web page. Next, and again, things that are on the uh, web page. Um, and one thing is all the broadcasts from both the 2014 and 2016 panels and the group discussions are there if you want to see them, talks, slides, um, a lot of background information as well. Next. And so, you know, if we're going to make a sustained change in undergraduate education, we all have to work together. And we're trying to make a cultural change and it goes from the administration down to the students and our students and professors deserve it, and they also need it for the future. So thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sharon, for your wonderful presentation. We do have several questions come in from the audience. Um, first, I'm actually going to start with a clarifying question on one of your slides. I'm going to have to navigate to it up here. If I can find it, this slide, the question was, um, do you know what is the number of responses for each school group? I do know that, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay. Um, this, um, yeah, I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay. It may be in uh, the, the survey results. We've updated them to include all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and. It may, the actual numbers may be in there. 
What I can do are, is... I will figure out what they are and put them in there. Okay, great. I can connect you with the individual who asked the question. Okay. Um, another question we had is, can you say a little bit more about what employers mean by systems thinking? For example, are they talking about complex systems, systems modeling, just the fact that the Earth is a system in itself? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? I would tend to say all of the above. I mean, they <laughs> talked about, um, they actually listed systems, you know, the interaction between, you know, the Earth's interior or surface, hydrosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, uh, and how they interacted with each other. Um, but they also, at the same time, they also talked about complex systems and how things work. A lot of their examples, in certainly in the working groups, were of how in their particular profession there were feedbacks and interactions and if you looked at it from just one point of view uh, or looking at you know one sort of thing sort of like if you were looking at fluid throw, flow through a reservoir or an aquifer that if all you looked at was the physics and you didn't look at the chemical reactions and the biological reactions that that was something that you would could totally miss or you know, so it was really both looking at the different systems within the earth, but also looking at uh, systems in terms of processes. Great. It was, to me, very surprising how much they uh, talked about uh, the need to think of everything as a system that worked together and interacted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... Now, how supportive are the deans of these department departments and the chairs who are committed to their plans and making changes in their programs? They seem very committed. Okay. We'll find out in January. Yeah, it sounds like... And the fact that some of them have already self-reported, I think, is a good sign. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, do you have a plan to have any additional meetings to convene about this this topic? Uh, the... Uh, organizing committee and a, a couple other people are meeting at GSA really to talk about uh, the next steps. What I mean, we know where we want to go, uh, but how are we going to get there? And one of the things that we did agree was that we really need to see how the action plans work out for the people who have started, because that will help us a lot to know how we should go forward. I mean, should we be having you know, we've had a number of people say you need in, you know, 2017, January 2017, which is too early, or 18, you need to do this again and have, you know, a combination of people who have already done this mm -hmm. uh, present as well as uh, new people. And, I mean, that's a possibility. Obviously, it takes funding. Right. Um, of course. But it's, yeah. you know, I mean, the, my view is if this is something that, the community thinks really needs to happen. It needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what is the plan for getting um, to a vision and change-like document? Do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, what is the, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. What is the plan for getting to a vision and a change-like document, actually creating it? That's actually what we're still working on. I okay. mean, Technically, I mean, I've read the biology one recently. Uh, we, you know, once we start getting these reports back, you could say that we were at the point of being able to put one together. Uh, it's a fairly major effort. I, I guess I'm a lot more interested in moving this forward and getting more and more departments involved um, than in obviously, and then writing a document, but I also realize that we have to have a document uh, to both get more uh, places interested in actually pursuing this, but also from a, a national level, a funding level, increasing the importance of the geosciences and what we do and, and things of that nature. So right. it's also a document that you can take to a dean, you can take to a president, mm -hmm. you can say, look, you know, this is why we are important. And so, um, but the steps getting there, I don't think we'll have the same steps that biology did. Okay. Um, I think we can learn from uh, what worked and didn't work from them. Okay. But that is something that we're discussing. 
Yeah, great. Um, changing topics a little bit, um, looking more towards competencies, I have a question that um, many faculty think of competencies as the ability to apply concepts to real data or to answer real questions. But how does this definition of competency compare to the definition used by those in industry? Uh, part, I mean, to some extent, that's that's true, um, mm -hmm. what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also uh, other kinds of competencies in terms of uh, the ones that you were mentioning and a lot of the things that, as an academic, I tend to think of is competencies in terms of doing doing the work, solving the problems. And they're also thinking about the non-technical skills as well, being competent to explain things, being competent to uh, talk to different audiences, uh, to be able to actually in work in a team. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, the academics said do teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the granularity of what uh, business or geoscience employers thought teamwork meant, uh, it's very, very different. And so that's a competency that they expect. OK, great. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I think at this point, we only have a minute left. There are still questions coming in from the audience. Um, but in the interest of time, we're going to um, move forward with some final notes from Pranoti Asher. Um, and if your questions were not able to be addressed during the discussion portion of this webinar, um, please feel free to email us your questions and we'll pass them along to Sharon.